Right, first of all, everyone, thanks very much for joining us for today's webinar. Um, the, the series has been sponsored by Sportsphere, uh, which is um, a sports star agency based down in London and presented by us ourselves, the guys at Pronoctis today. So it's a fantastic collaboration for all of us. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, and I know this, this one's been particularly popular, um, obviously because of the guests, not because of me. Um, and there's a reason for that. And that's because he's a former Olympian. He's the world-renowned sports scientist and the physical activity expert. And uh, he's also known as the, the professor of pain. I have no idea why that would, what that would mean. So um, without further ado, thanks very much for joining us and welcome, Professor Greg White. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It's great. It's uh, great to be on. And it is, you're right, it's a great series uh, that you guys are hosting along with Sportsphere. So it's uh, an honour to be part of it. So thanks. Yeah, and the inaugural guest as well. So how good's that? Uh, happy days. Yeah. And I'm, just <laughs> it can only get better from here. Let me tell you that. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure the audience will be the judge of that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, just to give the guys a bit of background, really, of what happened. So Sportsphere, obviously, with the Olympics being sort of deferred, um, We've got a lot of athletes looking, uh, looking to be able to make a positive influence for everybody out there, you know, be that sort of inspirational story or the hints and tips maybe that people could sort of um, take away from them over the next few weeks. And it was a bit of a no-brainer in terms of the collaboration. So if guys get some hints and tips and some motivation from, from you today, Greg, and maybe I'll chip in as well from our side from a human performance aspect, then it'll be a rich learning environment in general. Um, but what I'd like to do um, before we start is just give some of the logistics to the background. So you've, the guys that joined earlier, you've probably seen Nathan, who's now beavering away in the background, admitting the, the late entrance. He'll also be engaging with you on the chat. Any questions that go in there, he'll be filtering them and presenting them back to us as well, which will allow myself and the prof just to carry on having the conversation as well. So um, please, anything you want to add or any conversations or questions you want to have, please put them in the chat. We have got somebody working full time on them and we're roughly going to go for 90 minutes or so. But um, We'll see how we get on. So, Prof, I'm conscious that you've got a bit of a cult following. So the guys that are on the call that know you well, um, they'll know you probably inside out, potentially better than you do. Um, and, and, and then there's <laughs> other guys. Fun, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's other people on the call that maybe uh, are familiar with some of your work, but not fully in depth. So if it's all right with you, are you happy just to give us a bit of a, a, a brief overview of your bio, if you like? Because it's, um, it's definitely interesting, that's for sure. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's an unusual one, really, I guess. I, I mean, I, I, was, I was born and brought up in Luton. Um, I went to a state comprehensive school there, which at first sight you think doesn't make any difference, but as the story unfolds, you'll see why it does make a difference. Um, I kicked off my life as a swimmer. Um, I started racing when I was six, um, initially coached by my dad, who was my hero, remains my hero, um, and then went on to swim um, for Luton, Luton uh, Swimming Club for, for many, many years. I won a national title when I was 11, and then of course, Around about 14, all your mates leave. That's swimming. Uh, sadly, a lot, of, a lot of swimmers do leave around the sort of age of 13, 14. But that was at a time when um, it was post-1976 Olympics and there was a, an iconic story around the, the Olympic Games in 76 in Moscow. Uh, sorry, sorry, in Montreal, um, where uh, Team GB, Great Britain, uh, in the modern pentathlon, uh, was captained by a guy called Jim Fox. And Jim Fox uh, was fencing against uh, an, a Russian called Boris Onoshenko. Uh, I mean, this is one of the iconic stories of the Olympic Games. Uh, and he got hit, question mark, by Boris Onoshenko. Uh, the judge gave it to uh, Onoshenko uh, and Jim uh, appealed it, said it didn't happen. And if you remember when the boxer sat down in the ring back in 88 in the Seoul Olympics, it was a, it was a similar scene, but this was at the height of the Cold War. Uh, and eventually, hours after the protest, uh, they looked at Onoshenko's sword and realized he was cheating. So it became one of the iconic moments of, of, of Olympic history where Boris Onoshenko got caught cheating. He got thrown out of the games. The Russian team got thrown out of the games. And then actually, Great Britain went on to win the Olympic gold medal that year in 1976. So at the time, modern pentathlon was sort of, certainly people knew what it was. Uh, I mean, even today, a lot of people don't know what it is. Um, so I moved from swimming into modern pentathlon. Um, I was lucky enough to be good at it. Uh, I made my first national squad, uh, national junior squad in 1986 and went to my first world junior championships in 1986 where I finished, uh, I, I, and again, another weird one. I finished, um, I finished 12th overall, uh, but then first place and second place, uh, a Russian and a Pole got banned uh, for uh, illegal doping. Uh, and I was moved up to 10th place. Um, and then, then I sort of carried on my career in modern pentathlon. At the time, um, there was no money in sport. 
Um, there was no lottery funding that came in in uh, not until 19, uh, 1998, a very long time after I'd retired. Um, and so therefore you either studied or you uh, worked. Um, I try to avoid work as much as I can. <laughs> so I studied. <laughs> uh, I did an undergrad in London at Borough Road. Um, I then went out and did a postgrad, an MSc at the University of uh, Frostburg State University, part of the University of Maryland in the United States. And then came back to the UK and did a PhD at St. George's Hospital Medical School in the University of Wolverhampton in to examining the athlete's heart. Um, I won't bore you with the title of that. We can explore it if you want. Um, and so actually, by the time I finished my athletic career, um, I had a PhD. I was a, I was a doctor at that stage. Um, I finished my athletic career. Um, and shortly after that, I got appointed as the inaugural um, director of, of research for the British Olympic Medical Centre. I then supported the prep of five Olympic teams, winter and summer. Uh, and then in 2004, I became the director of science and research for the English Institute of Sport. I helped set up uh, the, the science as part of the English Institute of Sport, which is now much bigger than when I joined. There's only four of us when I first joined. Um, and now I have uh, my own clinic on Harley Street, the Centre for Health and Human Performance, where we look after a range of people from Olympic gold medalists and professional athletes all the way through to cancer sufferers, uh, cardiac disorders, uh, pulmonary disorders. Um, and I'm also a professor of uh, sport and exercise science at Liverpool John Moores University. So that's the, that's the career path to date. <laughs> Roses and my head hurts just thinking where to start there um, <laughs> and obviously on top of that you obviously you're still competing yourself and you've obviously got a busy life with the family so it sounds quite frantic <laughs> it, it's it, you know it's busy but I like I, I guess you know what I, I probably took up more than pentathlon five sports so we'll have a pop quiz for the people listening about what the sports are in modern pentathlon um, but I think that multi-event approach really suited me because I, 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 I love to be busy. Um, I am quite sort of eclectic in nature. I like to be, like to be doing different things. Um, some would say I get bored very easily. That's probably what it is. <laughs> so, so it is, and, and I've sort of, I, so I, it is incredibly busy, but that's the way I love it, to be honest with you. Are you do you get into mischief when you're not busy? I just, yeah, I, do you know what? I'm not very good. I'm not, a very good lazy person i think i think that's the thing is that i'm i'm without any shadow of doubt at my best when when i'm busy and and i love the, the sort of people call it stress and pressure and anxiety but actually for me i think what you can do is you can take that and actually make it a positive and, and for me that that's really what i feed on yeah so it sounds like even throughout your whole career that you've sort of thrived on that that pressure that environment regardless whether it's obviously the academic side the the sports side and now the consultant side is, is that a fair reflection yeah i think i think so i like to, do you know i'll I tell you what it is phil is i like to be challenged um and i think that that's where i get it from i mean i i, I still do obviously outside of the things like the sport relief and comic relief big challenges i do take on some really big projects i mean the great this week's been a good week actually we we made a film of a of a, of a lady i looked after called sylvia mcgregor um, who is a burn survivor and I trained her to swim across the Bosphorus so from uh, Asia to Europe last year we made a film of it and that film has just made it into the final of, of four film festivals uh, which we're, we're really excited about but I think that that, that to me is what what I love it you know it was it was a real challenge the unique challenge about that was actually psychological physiological it, it was it was technical it was tactical incredibly yeah. complex challenges which I think is why I thrive off yeah, and, and again, there's a few things you talked around there that resonated with me around, you know, we, we obviously use a very similar model there around the TTPP within the coaching world. So yeah. for the listeners there, you've already quoted some of them. So the tactical bit, how, you, how would you go about doing it? Uh, the technical side in terms of improving your skill set. And then obviously yeah. the physiological side, making yourself as, as fit as you possibly can and, and best prepared to, to, to the endeavor you're going to put yourself up against. And also the psychological side. Do you, do you have... In my world, it's not 25% each one. It depends on the individual in front of me and what you need to work on. Do yeah. you have one that you tend to be drawn into or, or do you constantly look at the holistics and then move around depending on what they're, they're sort of working on? Yeah, I think it's exactly that. I think, the, you know, the, the classic question, you probably get it all the time. The classic question that I always get is, you know, when do you start doing the psychology stuff? Yeah, or, <laughs> you know, or when are, we, when are you going to start working on the technical? And I think actually from, from session number one, uh, actually everything is inbuilt into every single session so it, for me you know the way I program every session has an outcome an outcome goal 
And so therefore, what you are trying to do is deliver to that outcome goal. And, and, and this is why a, a planned approach, a structured planned approach is so important. But what you are doing is, is that you are delivering to that goal. And in order to, to, to achieve that goal, you've got to, you've got to cover all of those areas. Not just about, training is not just about physiology. What you are doing is you're creating a, a psychology, whether it be coping strategies or positive self-thinking self or pacing strategies, you know, whether it's technical strategies. So for the triathletes, I look after things like brick sessions. You know, brick sessions are brutal physically, but they're also critical in terms of technically in, in that transition piece. A add on top of that, even things when it comes down to hydration and nutrition, is that what, what I impress on, on the people that I look after is that what we what is very much a trial and error process, some of these things. It's not all about hard science. And what, and what every training session is doing is it's honing in your ability to deliver excellence in each of those different areas. So the idea that you sort of have this in compartments, we do physiology here, we do psychology there, we do technical there, to my mind, is simply erroneous. They are all together. And then what you do as you're doing that, you can then identify areas of, of potential weakness. And so therefore what you can do is you can then focus your effort on those particular areas. So if, if, you know, if swim to bike transition is a real problem, then what you can do is you can change the programming a little bit focus on that swim to bike transition look at the technicalities around that and bring that up so that what you then start to do the, the way I, I always explain it is that what what we've got is we've got a set of determinants there are key determinants to performance and what i do is i measure you know as a physiologist what i'm doing is measuring the physical those physiological determinants of performance you then rank that in order against what we are trying to achieve and from that profile you'll see strengths and weaknesses and what the, what, the, what the developed training program will do is it will actually look to improve those weaknesses, maintain those strengths, and then by assessing on a continual basis, on profiling on a continual basis, what you do is you start to pick up where the improvements are coming, where they're not coming. And so that allows me to then remold the program to optimize the training impulse. Yeah, my, my sort of brain went off on a journey there because I'm conscious we've got a lot of corporate clients on the call today as well yeah. from businesses. And what you're talking about there directly maps across doesn't it and my experience of working with some large corporates is that their feedback loop is once a year they'll sit down for maybe 30 to 60 minutes and have a conversation around someone's level of performance um, and they'll also then not consistently carry on with that effective communication how often do you have contact with your with your athletes then that you're working with how often are you communicating with them so regularly is the answer to that. Um, I, I think, you know, the, 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 exactly as we're doing now, I think the wonderful thing about, about modern day technology is that what we can do is we can actually interface with people on a much more regular basis. It's much easier. Uh, it's much more timely, I think, is the key to it as well. Is actually that when a problem does come up, you can actually address that problem immediately. You don't need to, to note it down and wait a week before you get an answer to it. So, you know, for example, I, I, I work through email through facetime uh, through telephone through text uh, and what i try and do is I, I always try and respond as rapidly as possible invariably what i do is i read it and see what what requires a immediate response and then and then drive it from there but, but i think it is it is about doing it in that fashion what you do is you, you get to the solution much quicker uh, whereas i think actually if, if you think about it in the old days i mean you know to some extent that's what quality coaching is about that's what exactly what elite athletes do Elite athletes see their coach every single session. And, and, and the value of that is that what they're constantly doing is solving problems. They're constantly on, on, on guard for what you're doing and what's going wrong and so readjusting it. To some extent for the rest of us, for us mere mortals out there who are you know, no, no longer elite athletes or, or not elite athletes, actually having, having support which is on tap with very rapid response is exactly what we need. Yes, it's that feedback again, isn't it? And it's that, that co-collaboration of a solution to a problem, isn't it? Where you're both in it together, therefore you're trying to solve a problem, you have good open conversations, there's accountability to one another, and therefore you get the progress quicker. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and, and you know, that, that's what we're trying to do. Is, is, you know, something, I think it's always an interesting one. People always say to me, what's the shortcut? Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to performance, whether it is business, whether it's sport or whether it's life, there, there fundamentally are no shortcuts. Uh, it is, I have this little saying that nothing good comes easy. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that is absolutely true in whatever endeavor we're trying to achieve. Because, you know, fundamentally, if, it, if, if it, like, these are all sort of trite sayings that we've sort of used in common parlance now. But, but the, the, the truth is that if, it, if, it's, if, it's, if it's worth achieving, then it's going to be difficult to achieve it. Uh, and I think that you have to put the hard work in. And I think what we are doing, what, what we do, you know, uh, what I do as a physiologist, as a, as, a, as a mentor, as a coach, whichever way you want to put it, is try and expedite that process. There's no shortcut, but what we're trying to do is just, instead of take, take the time span, we're just trying to squash it down. And I think that, that's really what you're looking for when you do this. There is no way to get there by taking it easy, that's for sure. No, for sure. And it always needs that little bit of friction, doesn't it? And I think when, when I get that question around, you know, what is the shortcut? My, my answer is you, the only shortcut you've got really is to be brutally honest with yourself, be brutally honest with me, and we'll have a brutally honest relationship for, for positive gains. So they, therefore, we're opening up that sort of permission, if you like, to have good conversations. Um, because there's no point hiding away from it. Because if there's no accountability, then everyone's wasting their time, aren't they? No, no, for sure. I, you know, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, I, I, it's, it's always an interesting question that, we, that I get about you know, things like sport relief and comic relief is that it, invariably what you see is the performer. Uh, and, and actually, that, that's exactly the same as it is as being a coach in any environment. You know, when you watch the Olympic Games, uh, I can count on one hand the number of times that they actually interview a coach and ask him what has actually gone on. The, the focus of attention is always on the performer, which is the right thing. I mean, that's, that's the way it should be. But I think what you always have to remember is that behind that, there is an entire team of people who have done absolutely everything, who have committed just as much as that, as that individual has in to bring about performance. Uh, and, and they are accountable. You know, when things go wrong, rarely do they point the finger at the performer. They point the finger at their support team. It's their coach, it's their nutritionist, whoever it is. Uh, and so I think, you know, for us, I think to some extent, number one, you have to recognize that and it's absolutely the right thing. But you have to be quite resilient to that and quite robust in able to deal with that. Because, because you know, my, my job is to deliver success. That's what I always try and do. Uh, and and when, when we don't get success, which I, I touch wood is, you know, fairly rare, um, it, it does, it, you know, it hurts. It hurts because actually I am accountable for that. Of course, and, and, and you're invested in it, in it. You've invested all your time and energy and, and effort into that, and you're going along the journey as well. But it's, it's also, and we don't talk about this as coaches, it's quite a lonely place that yeah. when they're going into the arena and you've got to take a step back, there's literally nothing you can do now. It's all down to them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, it goes into areas like, I mean, imagine, you know, on these big, big sport relief challenges, for example. You know, when David Williams, when I go to wake him up one morning and he spent four hours with vomiting and diarrhea and he looks like you know death warmed up and i've still got to squeeze him into the water at 5 30 in the morning you know and and on top of that you've got you know the 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 push of social media instancy of of information that we have now and then you've got a, a, a camera crew who's following it all the way through etc the pressure that comes down uh, is it can be absolutely enormous uh, and, and it can be debilitating sometimes i think for some coaches what that they find it it's it's it, it, it's it, it, it to some extent it's disabling is that they, they just don't know what to do with it and, and i think actually you know when it comes to experience of coaches you know i've seen it i'm sure you've seen it as well with coaches who go to their first major championships you know i've seen you know new coaches at their first olympic games really struggle with the pressure that's brought to bear on them. It's a very, very difficult environment. And for many sports, those sports that don't normally get the media coverage that you do at an Olympic Games, actually, it can be utterly overwhelming. For the first time in, in your coaching career, all of a sudden, people actually care about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting one. And, and the coach being, as you say, the coach and the support staff being robust uh, and tenacious and resilient is as important as the athlete. Uh, having all of those qualities yeah especially more often than not the athletes don't win so not only are you going through the emotional journey of <laughs> now, the now it's up to them yeah. you've got to be there to to console them at the end pick them back up you know put the arm around them but also you're hurting yourself because you've been on that four six eight year your journey too yeah. so no I, I fully get what you're saying you talk i think i think on that as well phil though i think the interesting thing and, and it's the one thing that i do worry about actually now with modern sport in the uk is that I think that we run this, we, we run this system, which is money for medals. Uh, and, and what we do is we indoctrinate 
across the board from the athlete to the coach to the performance director to the to the entire to the entire infrastructure of the sport and then outwardly to the public that all that matters is medals and i think that's a very very dangerous place to be you know because i i've you know i, I have witnessed i mean i've done it you know i mean i've been i've been to i mean i've won a, a world championship and a european medal uh, equally i've been to world championships where in my opinion i competed better but didn't win a medal uh, and it, you know the the years that i grew up actually performing a personal best at a major championships really meant something uh, whereas now I think it, there's a little change in mindset, which, I, which worries me, is that actually it's not about performances in, in the sense. It's actually about medals. And if you don't win a medal, then you've been a failure. And, and that's a very, very dangerous place to be, not only for the athlete, but also for the entire team that surrounds them. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think um, unless some of the, the governing bodies are going to adjust that, I think that's going to be a bigger problem moving forward, isn't it? Um, but going back to yourself, Greg, I think you, you touched on, yeah. you know, your, your, your direct link with the likes of Comic Relief and Fundraise. And I think the last figure I saw is you've been involved directly with 58 million quid, I think you've raised over the years, which is phenomenal. Um, can you talk sadly, about... I don't get any of it. <laughs> <laughs> you only buy books with it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, how did you get into that? How did that come about? What was the first challenge? Can you remember? Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I remember. Well, funny enough, I've literally just come off a call with uh, with. A, he's the former CEO of Comic Relief, Kevin Cahill, and he is a now a lifelong friend of mine. Um, he called me up in two thousand five. I remember it well. It was it was a dreary day. I was at the English Institute of Sport at the time, um, and I was at Bisham Alley. And I remember he, he called me up and he said he said I've been given your name by a, a friend of yours who sits on our board, and it was uh, Crammy, Steve Cram who sits on his board. And he said, we've got this celebrity who has said that they will swim the English Channel for comic relief. And Crammy has said, you're the man to coach him. Will you do it? <laughs> and I, I actually, do you know what? I always run, I, I run the same approach to life as, as I did to that. And I always say yes. And then think about how I'm going to do it afterwards. <laughs> but, um, but it was literally, I mean, within three days, um, in walked David Williams into my, into my lab at the time. Uh, and I've, I've got the, they came in with a dot crew. And so I've got the film of, of me first ever meeting him. Uh, and that was in, that was in the autumn of 2005. And then 33 weeks later, uh, he successfully swam across the English Channel, um, was the first man to raise a million pounds from a single challenge. Um, and and it, it effectively what it did, it, it set off a cascade of, of events. It was successful on all sorts of levels. You know, he raised a million pounds at a time when there was no social media. It was, you know, it was, it was you know, it's a very different place and it wasn't that long ago. Um, and then since then I've done, for Sport Relief and Comic Relief, I've looked after 32 challenges now. And as you say, you know, raised that much money in that period of time. So it's been a, it's been a great journey, but that, that first one with David swimming across the English Channel, and, and David's actually uh, godfather to, to my youngest, to Mitch, um, and we're still lifelong friends off the back of that. It, it was a very special time. Well, I, I think as well, you know, joining the dots there between, you know, you talk about, you know, Steve Cram, the, the, the F chief, chief exec of Comic Relief, David Williams. I think when you go on these when you go on these journeys together, whether it's within the corporate work on a project and obviously the sporting and, and the charity world, when you're in it together, you, you, you're together through thick and thin, aren't you? And you stand together. And those relationships and the trust that is formed in those moments is really difficult to create anywhere else. Um, yeah. Unless you've got, let's take, let's, take, let's take a corporate view, for example. You need, need a really open, transparent, effective leader to be able to inspire people to drop their guard, be vulnerable, be vulnerable with one another, learn to fail, but also to progress to one another, to build those relationships. Because that's so important in success, isn't it? hundred percent. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting one because I think everybody's got their own particular coaching style. Um, but I think, I think what permeates across it, I think the, 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 the probably the most important thing is trust. And I think what you, what you are doing is that you're building trust in that individual because whoever that individual is. So for, you know, in that scenario, let's say, um, David Williams, he's got a trust that I can, do a number of things for him. Number one is that I can get him to a position where he can successfully swim across the English Channel. He's got to trust the process. Without that trust, he won't commit to it. And if he doesn't commit to it, he won't deliver, and so therefore won't won't start to uh, won't start to adapt, won't won't hit the goals. And all of a sudden, it then becomes self fulfilling because now he's not committing, therefore he's not achieving, and therefore he becomes demotivated, which means he commits even less. And so therefore, that is all driven by trust. 
I think, you know, when it comes to, I mean, I add on top of that, interestingly enough for David, it's actually, you know, these guys are incredibly high profile uh, and they have got very private lives. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they take me inside of that. And, and so my job is to keep that, that private life private, you know, which is a, a real worry uh, for, for some of these guys. Uh, you know, add on top of that with someone like Kevin Cahill, he's trusting me to deliver a, to deliver a man who, who ultimately is doing the one thing that these projects are about, and that is to raise money. You know, in elite sport, it's about, you know, winning medals. In business, it's about actually creating business, creating revenue and turnover. So uh, I th for me, I think there are lots of different ways in which you can coach, lots of different coaching styles, but I think all of them are underpinned by trust. And trust is first and foremost, and building that trust is central to everything I do with people I work with. Yeah, yeah, I really liked what you said there. And, and it, it sort of made me reflect on, on our business here at Pro Noctis where we, we work with our clients and the organizations and we always try our best to do the right thing by them. That's not always the easy thing to do. Sometimes you've got to have that difficult conversation, you know, in yeah. terms of, well, actually, we need to adjust this because of X, Y, and Z. Um, but you certainly know when you haven't got trust, that's for sure. And yeah. um, you, you certainly get found <laughs> out. And if I'm to be honest with you, I think that the environment we're finding ourselves in today, you know, with the coronavirus, very, very difficult. It, it's been an opportunity for leaders to step up, hasn't it? And, and for managers to step up and to build that trust, to show that empathy for their members and staff, because if they haven't, they're going to find out about it. No, absolutely right. I, and it is, I, I, I think you're absolutely right that it, it is only in time of crisis uh, that you see what true leadership is. And uh, Nelson Mandela coined it beautifully. You know, it is, it, it's, it, it's the mark of a man is not how he responds when things are going well. It's how he responds in times of crisis. And I think that's what great leaders and great coaches do, uh, because you know, coaching, uh, coach, uh, you know, it's it's an interesting one. I mean, if if I look at coaches across the board, I mean, you know, a man that really does spring to mind is someone like Jurgen Grobler, you know, in rowing. If if you, if you don't know, you know, what row, the rowing fraternity or, or what he's done, he's won an Olympic gold medal in every Olympic game since 1972. I mean, that is something else. And, and for me, that replication is, demonstra demonstrates a man that is able to cope with crisis because I, nobody would ever believe that every quadrennial, at the start of every Olympic cycle, he suddenly got four Olympic gold me medal winning athletes. You know, what, what he does is he, he develops that. Uh, and, and to be able to, to do that repetitively, every Olympic Games since 1972 is just, the to my mind, the mark of excellence. Yeah, so you're talking about consistency and adaptability yep. there as well. Over nearly you know, 48 years worth of work <laughs> at the highest level. I mean, yeah. look, look at technology alone, you know, in terms of never mind the sports science and the, the testing figures and, you know, the cyclists in triathlon got power meters. Imagine saying that in 1972. <laughs> what, 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 what? No, 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 you just ride nine what hours a day and you get fitter. It's fine. Um, some <laughs> people still train like that, though, that's for sure. But, well, I, I tell you what, I've got, I've got great shots, you know, in the 60s of, of measurement of VO2. You know, and people, people don't believe me, you know, when, when I, I say now, I mean, I, I've got, I, I can do VO2 maxes off, off my laptop. Uh, and it was when I started my career, you would need a room full of technical equipment and a, an entire team of people to use these, we used to have these things called Douglas bags, these massive plastic bags that you would breathe into. You then had an O2 analyzer, a CO2 analyzer, you had a ventilator. I mean, the list went on. You know, so the change in technology in such a short space of time, you know, what, what, what's happened to my mind when it comes to technology is we've seen, uh, we've seen a miniaturization of technology, which means now, you know, we've moved from, you know, wearable tech, what you can wear on your wrist. I mean, take a Fitbit, you know, what a Fitbit can do now, you know, would have put man on the moon in the 60s, you know, and so we've miniaturized it. We've also made it accessible to people in terms of cost. Uh, and then add on top of that, we've advanced sports science knowledge, sport coaching knowledge, sports medicine knowledge, all of that has advanced. So it, it, the, I think the past sort of four or five decades in sport has been an incredible time to be, to be involved. Yeah, for sure. And, and obviously your, your CV says that. Can I, can I bring you back to, let, let's take David Williams, for example, then. So you obviously did the, you did the swim across the channel for Comic Reef and then he did yep. the Thames. Now, yeah, the Thames, the same, yeah. to me, when you look at the statistics, sounds absolutely horrendous and brutal. And I start getting flashes of, um, you know, wetsuit sores, you know, cracked lips, hunger, tired, fatigue, mental fatigue. How difficult was it for you? <laughs> you know, as you say that, I look left. So I'll, I'll just turn this round on my wall. Uh, if you can just about see that. 
that was from that was from David. David David sent me that. Um, I think what, what that shows though is the enormity of the challenge more than anything else. I mean, what, what was fantastic about that is in 2011, 2006, when he swam the English Channel, 20 miles, 19.8 miles, point to point, people said it was impossible. Wouldn't be able to do it. Five years later, he swam the, 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 the equivalent of the channel, this different challenge, but the equivalent distance of the channel every day for eight successive days. I mean, just enormous. And it was a brutal war of attrition. And, and it's, it's, an, it's an interesting one. If people often say to me, what was the toughest? They're, they're all tough. Um, and, and they're particularly tough for me because I think, firstly, I mean, I, 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 on the individual challenges, I, I tend to join the guys all the way through. Because interesting enough, the one thing I can never give people uh, on most type of challenges is experience. Uh, and it's incredibly difficult to, to, to develop experience without actually doing it. Uh, and so, you know, working with ultra endurance athletes, you've got lots of lots of experience. Actually, it, it's, it makes life a little bit easier. But for these guys, it's their one and only attempt at what is a, a gargantuan ultra endurance experience. And so, what you know, obviously, I'm doing it alongside them. And but the key to it is, it's not my challenge. I am literally just there pacing, adding some experience. But I'm spending on the, on the, the Thames 14 hours a day, submerged in freezing cold water, um, with rubs like you wouldn't believe i mean what's great i mean since that it's interesting since that time so now i work very closely with hoob um who make the best wetsuits in the world bar none without any shadow of doubt and 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 in developing the right wetsuit it it gives me a real passion because i know what a bad wetsuit is let me tell you but i also know what a really great wetsuit is added on top of that i I work with bullet and bone to develop anti-chafe cream um because I know what a chafe is as well, let me tell you, <laughs> across the board, including the undercarriage. But it is, you know, I mean, these things, it's amazing what goes through your mind when you're in the water for 14 hours a day for, for eight consecutive days on somebody else's challenge, uh, whilst fundamentally you're invisible, which is, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so how, how did you find it? How did you cope? Was it, was it really difficult? Was, you know, they're, they're, they're all tough, I think. I think they're all very, very tough. And I think, you know, if you speak to guys who are on it with us, I'm not sure if Mark Woods is, is on here listening, but Mark Woods, is, uh, he was head of social media for, for Comic Relief, an absolute legend of a man who's on just about every challenge with me. Uh, and, and, you know, we would often chinwag about it. It was, I, I t- I, what, they are for, what they were for me was incredibly lonely. Uh, the, the very lonely times where my job is to be upbeat. Uh, and I think that's, that's an interesting one when it comes to coaches. And, you know, the job of a coach is to always be positive. And you know what? We have, we have bad days just like everybody else. And, you know, I, I, you know, I distinctly remember getting into the water at 5.30 in the morning, some mornings thinking, gosh, you know what? What I want is a cup of coffee, feet up, you know, in front of the TV. <laughs> you know, and, and, but, but there's nobody you can talk to about that, number one. And also, secondly, there's no way that you can have that as your external persona. Your external no, persona has to be fully positive and fully supportive on a continual basis. And, and, and they are, they're difficult places to be. I think when you're in that position of, um, you, you're almost in a position of leadership yourself, there, aren't you? You're leading your client through the challenge. We, we talk quite often around... Um, something called leader's legs, we call it, where you're in front and it gives you a natural lift, but it only lasts for a certain period of time, doesn't it? And then obviously you fall <laughs> off a cliff. You, <laughs> you definitely can, yeah. <laughs> so it's about managing your energy and expectations and everything around that. And I think bringing it back on to today, um, the challenges we're seeing around the coronavirus, I'm seeing a big challenge around people managing their motivation and their personal energy levels in these challenging times. Is that something you're seeing? hundred percent. And I think, I think what's interesting about it, I don't know if you found this, but I'm sure others have. And actually this week is so far, this week is the toughest week. And I think one of those, one of the reasons for that, and it, uh, it's the same in business and it's the same in elite sport. I often talk about this. I talk about, people often talk to me about motivation. You know, what, how, do you, how do you give people motivation? Well, the first thing is you don't give people motivation. What they do is they develop their own motivation. But I think it, the key part of any big challenge is the middle section is that, that you're absolutely right. Those sort of leaders legs, you know, for the first couple of weeks of, of the lockdown, it was easy because it was like being on holiday. The sun was shining. Everyone's happy. A bit of homeschooling. whoop de doo The kids are excited about it because they're being schooled at home and you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then what then happens is we're, we're into week three. It's you know, you're sort of like, you know, where, where are we now? You sort of look behind you think, when did this start? It started so long ago, you can't really see the start point. And then you look forward and you think, where is the end point? I can't, 
well, how far away is it? Oh, and, and now, you know, it's that midpoint. And I, I put it, the analogy is the, the English Channel, halfway across the English Channel, five hours in, you've got, an interesting one about English Channel is you know how far you've got to go. But, but when you look behind you, you can't see the White Cliffs of Dover. When you look up in front of you, you can't see France. And you are in the middle. You're in no man's land. And I think big challenges, like currently, this is a big challenge. You know, COVID and the lockdown is a big challenge. For me, where we are right now is we're right in that middle portion. Uh, and it, it might not be the middle portion. It might be in the, in the first third. Um, but not knowing when it's going to end drives anxiety and stress. But equally now, what it also drives, it just drives a little blunting of that motivation, a little bit of boredom, a little bit of oof, can't be bothered. And, and so for me now, the first three weeks were easy. Now is the time we've really got to focus and try and energize people to, to maintain what they're doing. So maintain physical distancing, keep washing hands, but physical activity, absolutely fundamental to that. Both bolstering that immune system, particularly around trying to bulletproof your immune system, making sure you get quality sleep, making sure, which I'm sure everyone else is doing, because I'm doing it, <laughs> alcohol consumption isn't excessive. You know, just doing those things and maintaining it now is much more difficult than it was in the first three weeks. And I think there's, there's a bit around pacing yourself, whether yeah. there's an athlete on this call or, or, or whether it's a business person, you know, there's, there's no point putting yourself on the turbo trainer for six, seven hours a day inside out going on Zwift or, you know, as an executive, <laughs> bearing yourself into work, you know, checking emails at 5am 5, 5 and also at midnight. There's a big piece around pacing yourself in terms of making that immune system bulletproof, isn't there? 100% absolutely no doubt about that you know and it is you know it's funny because you know the analogy runs across all of this but you know you go back to the big ultra endurance challenges is i always say to people success is not what you do in the first on the first day or on the first four days success is only measured by when you go across the finish line it's only measured by completing that challenge and and i think you know what you have to think about is how do we get to the finish what we now, it's an interesting one because I think what you have to be very careful of is not to, to, to create that long-term goal too far away. I think to some extent what you do have to do is think day by day. You know, what am I doing today? What, what are the goals I'm setting today? What am I trying to achieve today? What am I going to do tomorrow? So that, that goal, goal setting, which is, again, you know, from an athlete's perspective is what we do is we program daily. But from a business perspective, that's what we should be doing with an eye on the long-term goal, recognizing that where we're trying to get to. And it's just about making sure that what we do is we set a structure up in place, which will bring us to that ultimate success, which is the finish line. Yeah, definitely. hundred percent. And, and my, my mind went straight away there because you, you've had some experiences. Lately, sorry, sorry, sorry about that, mate. No, no, no. It's, no, it's a really good thing. It's a really good thing, Greg, because you just, it's just rich information and it gets my, gets my brain going. It's fantastic. Um, I know that last year yourself, in terms of personal challenges, you did the Norseman, didn't you? And also yeah. there, there was a world record involved somewhere. I don't know if you could shed some light yeah. on that for us. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so what I tend to do it every other year, I've sort of done challenges for myself. So I've done things like um, I raced the marathon, the Saab, toughest foot race on the planet. Um, I raced the race across America cycle races. They call it the toughest cycle race on the planet, West coast to East coast, USA. Uh, and then, so in, in the line of the toughest, <laughs> uh, next on the list was the Norseman, which they call the toughest triathlon on the planet. And it is utterly brutal. I mean, it is something else. It just it, take a look at some of my social feed and you'll see some of the images from that. I mean, really, really tough. So that, that was a, a great achievement. And what, what, what you try and achieve in that, there's a, they call it the Norseman Black. I could show you on my other wall. Uh, uh, I've got uh, the T-shirt the up there. Everybody tries to achieve the black, top 160, top 160 athletes. Uh, get the black what it weirdly what it means is you get to go up a mountain to finish 17 kilometers up a mountain uh, and that, that's the reward for getting a black but it is it's sort of the most sought after black t-shirt in triathlon certainly probably in sport um so that that was a, that was a, a great experience and again actually coming back to the team concept the team and i know andy digweed uh, is is on on this call uh and uh rich rich ball who's a lifelong friend of mine uh, ben hull and a guy called matt littler became my team on the road absolutely crucial nothing great is ever achieved alone uh, and the team that works around me are just magnificent and i thank them for that um and then and then this year i was approached by an american client uh, and i looked after him from october and in february i think it was a week we got back a week before the the, the lockdown um we broke, he broke the world record for seven marathons on seven continents uh and to put that into perspective uh we completed that 
in in 81 hours seven marathons including the marathons on seven different continents uh, and it was a, a truly remarkable experience absolutely amazing we, we kicked off in antarctica antarctica to argentina argentina panama panama madrid madrid oman uh, sorry madrid egypt egypt oman oman perth uh, and it was a brutal <laughs> a brutal war of attrition but to break the world record was just absolutely incredible what was the hardest bit was it the racing or the the travel uh, probably all together I, I, probably uh, to be honest with you, one of the toughest things was was environmentally um so we, we kicked off in antarctica it was it was minus 15 uh with a humidity of about 10 percent very dry very arid the driest place on the planet it's the biggest they call it white desert uh, which is what it is um very cold um and then within 24 hours so we'd then gone to argentina for a marathon and then within 24 hours we're in panama uh, and, and again take a look at my social feed you'll see the first as we kicked off we kicked off at 5 a.m in pitch black and through the head torches you can actually see the humidity it was about it was 100 percent humidity effectively about 98 percent humidity and it was almost like precipitation it's almost like water in literally running through a pool of water uh, and that run it went from it went up to 40 degrees centigrade uh, and 80 percent humidity so in a space of a 24-hour period three marathons with a temperature range of 50 over 50 degrees centigrade and a, a relative humidity change of of 80 percent i mean it was it was very very tough physically and mentally yeah and and i'm fortunate not in terms of my personal experience but i have coached people that have gone and done some of them individually yeah and, and i've seen the challenge of that and so never mind the the, the, the culmination of them all together that's incredible um i think just to get some engagement with the guys there's really active on the chat box so i think we'll fire cool. in some questions before we carry on i mean there was one question um it's further up the chat so please forgive me with names what what was your hardest challenge personally and also the one you've coached somebody for <laughs> honestly hardest challenge is having children <laughs> That is, if you if you haven't got kids, uh, then you won't understand what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, it is tough. It is bloody tough. Um, I, I think you know from the ultra endurance perspective. I, you know, I, I think they're all they're all tough on for various different reasons. I think probably cold open water uh, are the real tough ones, um, particularly when I'm I'm supporting somebody. So with David Williams, for example, I mean the Thames does stand out as probably one of the toughest simply because I'm, I'm moving at his pace so i'm not generating anywhere near as much heat um it's incredibly cold and the cold is insidious it just gets into you, you can't escape it and when you're in there for 14 hours a day it just it feels like it's purgatory it feels like there's, there's never any end to it so i think you know from a, from a psychological perspective probably the thames is, is the toughest um i think you know i mean I'm, one challenge a lot of people don't know about is um uh, with Joe Brand was an amazing challenge. She walked from Hull to Liverpool. Uh, it's 140 miles in seven days, which is a, a truly remarkable achievement for Joe. Um, but uh, sadly, on day three of that challenge, my father passed away. Uh, and, and I think for me personally, it's probably the toughest thing that I've ever done to continue on, on that challenge. So I, 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 I take a very professional approach to what I do. And I think actually I'd committed to, to getting Joe across uh, and so I was not going to leave her. Um, but I think from a personal perspective, without any shadow of doubt, that's the toughest thing I've ever done. Yeah, I can imagine you being completely torn there from a professional yeah. to a family capacity, isn't it? Yeah. Very difficult. Did, um, without going into too much personal stuff, but did the time on the walk help you just reflect a little bit? Or was it, you know, you were literally torn in half? I, yeah, it's, it's an interesting... I think, you know, the time on the walk filled, filled the void. Uh, I, I'm not so sure that it... it it didn't soften the blow that was for sure um but I, it, it, yeah it, it was a very it was a very difficult time without any shadow of doubt i mean it was a difficult challenge as well i mean it was the the, the conditions and you know one of the reasons i definitely wasn't going to leave joe the the conditions were absolutely brutal i remember i remember one day we were walking across the highest point in england uh, and on the road next to us the wind was blowing so hard it actually blew a juggernaut off the road it was, uh, it was, I mean, we do always do these challenges in, or we did them in, in February and March, you know, it was always the worst time of year to do them. <laughs> it was absolute madness. So it was, you know, I, 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 I love them. So actually to, to, to leave something that I loved uh, seemed like a, a double blow. So 
that was one of the drivers that, that, that kept me going because I, because it, it, I do, I am very, very lucky to work at, in something that I absolutely love. I think that ties into, um, we were talking about the question around motivation earlier. And people says, you know, as a coach, how do you motivate people? Or can you give them motivation? And, I, and I, I'm completely on the same page. You can't. It has to be, you know, intrinsic from them. But what you can do is you can create an environment where you find out whether they're committed or not. So it's two different. If you're committed, you will find the motivation. If you're committed to your goal and your purpose, because that's what you talked about there with Joe, wasn't it? You were committed. I was going to see it through. So the motivation just came. Um, but I think a lot of the athletes and the business people on the call, if you're committed to doing something, you'll find a way to do it. Is yeah. that something you would agree with or, or you see? No, 100%. I, I, just, I, I have this triumvirate that I work through. And, and, and I think the first thing is about belief. Is that I think that what you have to do is you have to believe you're going to be successful. And, and I think that's really important. And actually, m much of what we do as coaches is actually creating that belief. And, we, and it is, it's a slow creation. You know, as a leader, if you're in business, what you are trying to 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 instill in the guys that work for you is, is for them to believe in, in what the dream is and how, and the fact that they can actually get there. And I think in difficult times like now, you know, it, it, during this COVID uh, issue is, is, a, is a great example of that. But even post COVID, I think probably much greater problems uh, when we come post COVID actually, when we come out of this, but I think making sure that, that you and everybody around you believes that you can achieve it is fundamentally important because once you've got that belief, what you then do, is you then start to commit and what you do is you commit resource and that resource is time it is money uh, it is effort it's all of those resources that you commit to it once you start committing in a structured way and this is where the structured plan really does matter once you start committing what you then start to see is you start to see progress and what that progress drives that progress drives motivation because all of a sudden you see that you're getting better you see that you're getting faster you see that your balance sheet looks a little bit better you know, whichever environment it is that you're working in, you see that improvement. And with that improvement comes motivation. And the more motivated you are, the more you believe. And it then feeds into the belief, commitment, motivation, and it becomes self-fulfilling. Cracking any one of those, a problem in any one of those particular areas can then turn you in the opposite direction. So working on that is really important. That links really nicely with one of the questions, actually. Um... So is it fair to say that maybe if, if somebody's not quite believing, not quite committing, et cetera, are they some of the clients that maybe you can't work with or you don't end up working or maybe you have to part with? Have you ever come across somebody you can't coach, basically, is the question? Never. Like, never. <laughs> is that where the professional <laughs> pain comes in? You I'd find say, no honestly, it's, it's rare. I mean, do you know what? There is this nonsense that we, that we spread in, in uh, physiology that, that we say people are non-responders. Okay. I just don't fundamentally do not believe it. What they are is they haven't responded to your intervention. They haven't responded in the way that you want them to, to the way that you've presented that intervention. And so for me, there's no such thing as, as somebody who can't do something. I think basically what you have to do as a great leader is you have to adapt your approach. I think what, what I see, I, I see a lot, you know, I speak to lots of these, both in, in business and in sport. And I think if you are, if you are immovable in your approach, then you lack excellence. I mean, I think that that's the bottom line is that excellent coaches, excellent leaders have the ability to alter their approach. And, and invariably you have to do that on, on an individual basis with a team that you're working with. You know, the way that you look, you know, think about, you go back to rowing, you think about a men's A. The, the, I, I, it's interesting. You know, this to me is where we've really come on in terms of, of coaching science is that the idea that you take a, a group of men's heavyweight rowers you take eight of them and you train them in exactly the same way and somehow you're going to get the best outcome. Yeah. Utter nonsense. You know, they're individuals. So I think it, it, what great leaders are able to do is adapt their approach to bring out the best in every individual within their team. And, and I think if there is somebody in your team or as an individual who is not responding the way you want to, what you should do is have a good, a good look at yourself, self-reflect on what you are doing and what you can do better. And to that end, I think that you know, th that's not to say there aren't people who simply won't make it. I mean, there are some people who really just don't want it. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what you have to do is exhaust all of your skills and expertise before you then say uh, they're not going to be able to do it. Yeah, for sure. We, the sort of language we use there is um, the most effective leaders, managers, coaches are the ones with the highest level of behavioral flexibility. Yep. the ones that can adapt their approach to, to what they're seeing in front of them. So it's not that 
you know, I've seen very um, direct styles of coaching, which, which is fine, you know, and in a certain time, you've got to be direct. Yeah, no, no. Yep. Time pressure, security, safety yep. pressure, you need to do this, you need to do it now and I need it done by then. That's absolutely fine, you know, where I think coaching has got this um, sometimes a softy, softy approach that it's all about facilitation, open-ended questions, and it's not. It's, it's the full continuum, isn't it, from direct to indirect approach. Well, I think what it is, Phil, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think what it is, it's actually taking that spectrum and deciding, deciding on the individual who's in front of you, where on that spectrum you're going to sit. Because the didactic authoritarian approach uh, works incredibly well with some people. So you might be at one end of that spectrum without any softly, softly approach, you know. But, but what, you, what you have to do as a great leader is identify in your charge what what is going to work for them and then also once once you're in that process to be able to adapt that to make sure that you continue to get the best out of them because what, what i find is that actually the the, the it changes over time you know there's a great story with i mean talk about david Wallace for example there's a great story i remember after one training session we came into the the, the, the uh into the changing rooms and somebody said to him well david what are you doing and he looked at me yeah he said next year i'm going to swim the english channel and i listened to this and i thought you know with 40 percent uh, 40% success rate, 60% of people who attempt the English Channel solo fail. Uh, and, and to me, that was, it was the wrong, r- wrong response. Uh, and so following that, I, I did a whole host of different things with him, uh, including a very cold open water, miserable swim. And we were at Dorney, uh, and, uh, where we used to do a lot of our training. And somebody said to him in the change room after we got out of the session, he said, oh, David, I saw you in the water, what, what are you doing? And he said, I am attempting to swim the English Channel. And to me, that was a much better place to be. It wasn't a lack of belief, but it was, it was a, a level of respect of how difficult the challenge was going to be. And that then became the feeder into actually driving the commitment for the training to achieve that goal. And I think that feeds really nicely into, um, there's another question just come in regarding, a lot of people are, obviously the, the, the race program has been absolutely obliterated and we don't even know when it's going to start again. Yeah. And people would have been phasing themselves through to peak at certain times. Is there any, is there any, tips and hints and tricks that you're saying to your clients regarding how to get through this because i'll tell you what i'm telling my clients go and enjoy yourself go 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 if you're gonna go on a bike ride go and smile you know be mindful (laughs) rather than going out concentrating on the numbers go and enjoy yourself because why so serious why so serious just just chill out and and tomorrow will come i'll just think yourself that's where me and you differ mate (laughs) we finally found somewhere (laughs) No, you know, I, I think you're right. I think what's interesting actually now is that there is less, there's less, there's certainly less pressure. I think what one, one uh, is a very close friend of mine, uh, Andy Lane, Professor Andy Lane, professor of sports psychology. And, and we have this discussion on a regular basis about, about data. You know, data has changed so much in sport and data is really valuable. Uh, it can be really valuable. Let me rephrase that. Data can be really valuable. But I think actually some people are utterly disabled by data is, you know, things like, you know, the Garmin or the Strava or you know everything becomes about data and, and you know you think in, you said it earlier in the power meters on bikes and you know I talk to some of my clients and all this all it consumes their mind uh, and of course the, the bottom line is that, that then what it does it then means that that what they do is they stop doing things for fear that they won't be able to hit the data hmm. and so what it then becomes it becomes demotivating and so I think you have to be very, very careful about the use of data and, and whether it is motivating or, or demotivating. I think what is lovely now, you're absolutely right. Interesting enough, and I, I'm, I've, I've done it. I'll do it. I did it yesterday and I'll do it again this evening. I go out on my bike and I actually, I have spotted houses and fields on a regular bike that I go on that I'd never seen before <laughs> because usually I've got my chin on the chin strap and I'm hanging in for dear life. You know? yeah, try, trying to remember to breathe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what am I doing? So I think there, there is an element of that, definitely. I think what we can do is we can just sort of disengage from it a little bit. And actually, internalizing it is really important because for me, I, I work a lot with my guys on rating of perceived exertion. You know, I, I, I work with elite athletes. I can ask them what their heart rate is. And without looking at their monitor, they can tell me what their heart rate is mm. because they know where they're at. They know where they're operating. And that's, that's not just for elites. That should be for everybody. We should have an understanding about what, what our workload is. Um, and so I, I think, you know, getting away from data is a good thing. Uh, at the same time, what I would say now is that we're in a period of time. I, I, what I would do is, in your mind, is put it as Christmas. And I'll, I'll quote the, the great Daley Thompson on this one. 
and that was somebody once asked him why he went out training uh why he went out training on christmas day and his response was because nobody else does and i think it's absolutely true is that what you've got an opportunity for now is that and again in this middle section where motivation might be a bit low is the harder you work now the better you will come out the back end of this and the better you will be for it because there are those around you who aren't putting the work in. Yeah. And I think that comes really nicely, excuse me, into your, your bit around having a structure and readjusting your structure. So goals change, goals change, you know, and, and a lot of it's outside of your control. What you can control is how you adapt to that. So everything about that behavioral flexibility and I get, okay, my race was going to be July. There's no, there's what I'm spotting in September that may or may not happen. But let's imagine it is. Let's go for that. And then the moment that's cancelled, let's readjust to October, November, or even 2021. But that's all we can do to, to keep our motivation and commitment, isn't it, moving forward? Yeah. Otherwise, it's just going to be dead time. Listen, I, th I think the really positive thing is, you know, what I say to some of the guys that I'm looking after currently is to say, look, what you've done thus far isn't wasted. You're in great physical condition. Yeah, it's in that's the bank, it. isn't it? that's in the bank and you're in a great platform the other great thing about what is currently happening is you're not injured and hopefully you're not sick so normally when we get to a position like this the reason why you know is actually we're laid up because we've got injury uh, and and what that means is we can't put the quality of work in that we require what, what we've got now is we've actually got an opportunity where life is a a, a, a bit more relaxed we've certainly got more opportunity to do the training the, the key to it for me is just to remember that you've the amount of work you've already put in isn't wasted. And remember, maintain the quality. I think the danger now is that people just overdo it. They, they, just, they increase the volume a little bit too much. And what they do is they drift off the quality. Keep the program, keep to the program, keep the quality in the program. And what you'll do is you'll continue to advance as you go through it. Where that end goal is, try and rather than focus on that end goal, because it is a movable feast that currently is think about the medium term goals and the short term goals think about it session by session what am i trying to achieve in this session and smash it out to achieve that goal reflect on it and celebrate it and, and that, that will keep you moving forward yeah and i think that links to the day job isn't it you know in terms of we've got these big goals let's just do let's do positive steps today I'll make sure we're closer to where we want to be when we come around to tomorrow for sure um sure. can i ask a specific question then um there's, there's one person on the call here that's got a long-term condition, uh, fibromyalgia. Yeah. Um, is there any top tips you've got for them in terms of um, considering an endurance challenge? Because they really want to positively inspire other people. Yeah, I mean, tough, tough condition, fibromyalgia. I mean, it's, it, it's an interesting one. I think, firstly, I mean, I, I deal, I, I work an awful lot within sort of clinical management. Um, and I think that the first thing is just to make sure, first and foremost, is health. Um, and, and I think it's crucial that you maintain your quality of health, irrespective of where that health spectrum is. Um, so I think what, what you have absolutely got to do is make sure you take the team with you. So that is your, your healthcare team that you've got around you. Granted, very few of those will understand what ultra endurance is or what it requires or what it takes. But to some extent, that's your job to explain it to them. Uh, and to keep them abreast of it. And I think if, if you take the team with you, they can become really supportive as you go across, as you go through this. Um, I think make sure that you optimize your health. I mean, one of the things that I spend far too much time on is actually explaining to people that, that health uh, and, and injury reduction is as important as training, um, if not more important, uh, because when you're injured and sick, you miss training. So therefore you get this reversal of, of, of adaptation that's taking place. So looking after your health, and obviously if you're in a, in a, a situation where you've got a clinical condition, which, which could be exacerbated by this type of activity, you've got to work really, really hard at that health. So make sure that you've got a structured plan around you, which enables you to deliver on the ultra endurance goal, but maintains health at the same time. And then I think the other thing is to, that really is trying to find people who understand uh, your condition. Um, this is any condition, but and, and people who understand your condition and how that condition uh, is impacted on by endurance training by training in general and how best you can you can create the right approach so for so for example i mean i, I looked after an incredible guy called kevin mashford who is heart is he had a heart transplant um and he cycled from his home in bristol to newcastle where he had his transplant 360 miles 90 miles a day now that is with somebody else's heart beating in his chest i mean a, a truly phenomenal achievement there, there are nuances around that, really important nuances around things like premature, I won't bore you, but premature coronary artery uh, disease, so coronary atherosclerosis, 
uh, of the transplanted heart. You've got things about immune function and rejection. Um, and all of those things have to be tailored in to the training program. And, and for me, actually, the, the, the relationship between coach and athlete becomes even more important because the information feedback has to be on a continual basis to make sure that you, you avert any problems as rapidly as possible and hopefully avoid them completely. So it, it, in, in short, it's about the team. It's about finding somebody who understands your condition uh, who can support you through that and coach you through that. And it's about making sure you maintain as much dialogue as possible going through that process. Brilliant. Great answer. Thanks, Greg. Um, there's another question come in regarding, obviously the team's important, but when you're going off to do these endurance events and you're going solo, so whether it's, you know, the Ice Ultra or the MDS, for example, is there any tips you've had over the years that maybe you could share with people about that, that recovery in the moment, how you look after yourself, you know, 24-7? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I would say it's one of those things that is always put on the back burner, generally across the board for everybody. Um, you know, it's it's it, recovery is is probably the least respected element of training, uh, where actually it's the most it's the most one of the most crucial parts of of, of training, particularly as we age, uh, because what we do as we age, we we recover less rapidly. So I think making sure that you've got a structured plan to recovery, all of all of the success. Uh, all of the successful events that I've been involved in have been because uh, the challenger, so coached, is because the challenger is compliant and fastidious about recovery. Uh, because that's the crucial element of actually during the challenge about keeping going. And I think it's really, really important. I mean, to some extent, what have you got to think about? You've got to think about obviously health status and that, that's multiple things. Um, so it is about, it's about things like rubs, sores, those type of things, making sure on top of those. I always say to people, look, you know, small problems become big problems very rapidly and big problems are challenge ending. Uh, whereas small problems, I mean, I, I, I can tell you some athletes that I look after who just refuse to stop uh, and it always ends badly, always. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you've got a problem, stop and fix it very early make sure that, that you do that so you know, after 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 a training session if you've got a problem make sure you solve the problem before you start moving forward again i think you know things like nutrition are absolutely crucial so i work very closely with elevar um who design sports products for for over 35s uh, again what you have to remember is that we need to be bespoke about what, the interventions that we use because what what we require is has to be individualized to ourselves um, add on top of that, uh, one of the things that I think is very poor across the population in general, but particularly in athletes, is sleep. Um, sleep is absolutely fundamental to, to the restorative uh, hypothesis, the fact that actually most of the adaptation we're looking for occurs during sleep, particularly during that REM sleep, during the, during the high quality sleep. So making sure we optimize that is absolutely crucial. So I think, I think to some extent, we, we structure training and we accept that. I think what you have to do is make sure that you take a very structured approach to recovery because what you are looking to do is not only recover physically, but you're looking to recover psychologically, absolutely crucial, but also recover technically, tactically, uh, and, and all of those other aspects that come along with it. So planning of recovery is, is as important as planning of training. Yeah, and I think I think this I think you've this is a fantastic segue without actually setting up in terms of what I think the next steps are going to be potentially globally regarding coronavirus in recovery. But what what you brought to life for me there was was memories um, of, of my time in the military where it was all about recovery, and it, and it was forced recovery. You know, no, you go to sleep now. You get up at this point. You get clean at that point. You take your wet socks off. You take your wet kit off. You get yourself clean. Otherwise, you can't fight tomorrow. That, that's it, black and white. And I think those key key principles and I suppose when you boil it down, it's decision making, isn't it? It's, it's information and then decision making. I, I decide that I'm getting out of this hard training session and I'm getting straight in the shower to stop that bacteria buildup. Therefore, I'm already starting my recovery in a positive step and then it, yeah. it leads from there. Yeah. So if we were to take a bigger picture then, some of our clients and conversations we're having now is regarding when we're coming out of this lockdown, what's it going to be like? Because we're not just going to flick a switch and then the old world's going to happen. I think the world's going to be very different. We're going to have a new, new world. Um, and we're starting to talk around what we would call decompression. So decompress people, start thinking about how are people going to start using their leave um, uh, positively, especially if they can't still travel to go on holiday. How are we going to, how are we going to manage people's shift patterns? How are we going to manage people's energy and recovery 
sessions there. Um, and also, what opportunities are we going to provide as an organization, potentially, for these people coming back into the new world? Is that something that you're seeing more increasingly sort of as a, as a, as a hot topic right now? Definitely. I mean, it's interesting because it, it, the spectrum's quite broad, but I mean, I, I'm currently working with my clinic. Uh, I've got the Center for Health and Human Performance on Harley Street. One of the things that we're working very hard on currently is actually rehabilitation from COVID sufferers. Uh, I mean, what, what, what we are seeing is that, that if, you, if you contract COVID, uh, is that the, the, the recovery process appears to be brutal, uh, much longer than it is from, from many other uh, conditions. Uh, and so what, what I'm doing with that is that I'm designing the, the, the return to physical activity. Uh, other colleagues of mine are doing around nutrition, around psychology and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think, again, you know, it comes back to, it probably sounds a bit boring as I repeat it, but it, it's about planning for that is absolutely crucial. I, I certainly think when it comes sort of overall within business, for example, the idea that, that what we can do is just sit around and wait. And as soon as they release lockdown, life, moves back to normal and I'll, you know, it's a magic wand from government and all of a sudden we're back in. Absolutely untrue. What we should be doing is planning for that. And, and there has to be a structured approach once, once we return. Uh, and, and obviously many of those things are unknown. Um, but equally what we should be doing, I, I, I create this thing, we call it the if then plan, is that there are risks of things not happening. So it, it, what happens if this happens? Then what I do is I create a solution for that. So instead of this if this risk then becoming actually a, a damaging to, to our overall project. What we do is we create solutions for it. So it's just another stepping stone on the process of, of delivering success. So I think sitting down and, and thinking very, very hard about what the plan is going to be post COVID, um, both individually and as an organization is absolutely crucial. And it, it will undoubtedly be those people who've got the best plans, the best structured plans and who deliver on those plans. They are the ones who are going to come out of this in the best possible position. Uh, if, if you think that you're going to sleepwalk out the back end of this it is a very dangerous place to be. Yeah. And I'm, I'm certainly talking to a lot of my executive clients that I'm coaching around. They've got to model that behavior as well. If you're working 100 mile an hour now, seven days a week, 16 hour days, and you know, you're getting a little bit of sleep in, you're already deprived, obviously. But you've got to, you've got to you know, in your newsletter, say, look, I am burnt out. I'm going to take a few days off and tell people, you know, and say, and I encourage you to have good conversations with your managers and leaders and do exactly the same thing because we're going to need to have this recovery to be able to go again. For yeah. sure, for sure. Um, what would your top tips be for people right now? To, to manage their energy levels. So we're potentially halfway through, potentially, we don't know. Um, what would be your top tips if you could give them maybe two or three things? Do you know what? I spend a lot of time talking about goal setting. And I think goal setting is really important. It's a part of this planning process. But I think, you know, the, the difficult thing currently is not knowing and not knowing what, what's going on in the future. I think what, what we should be doing now is actually creating our own plan by setting short-term goals. What are we looking to achieve today? Write that down put it somewhere public. So put it on the fridge, uh, let everybody else in the house know, uh, and, and just create a plan over the week. And, and what that will do is it will bring what we've lost. And, and one of the things that really drives stress and anxiety currently is loss of structure. Uh, and what we really need to do is re reconnect with that and, and actually grab a hold of it and actually bring it back under our control, start to control our own structure. And I think short term goals are a great way to do that plan what you're going to do during the day and actually you know, classically deliver on that plan. You know, if it is an 8 a.m. exercise session followed by 9 a.m. emails, followed by 10 a.m. conference call, do it at those times. Don't, because you've got plenty of time on your hands, don't think, oh, I'll just leave it and I'll do it later and I'll do, stick to that plan, structure the plan so that you deliver to it. And what you'll get from the back of that is you'll get, you'll get control back, you'll get structure back. Uh, and, and what it'll also do is it will ease that, that, transition when we come back into normal life because as soon as we come back into normal life that structure will be imposed directly on us and then it becomes a, a double whammy for stress and anxiety because we move from this laissez-faire attitude into a very structured environment so just maintain the structure set yourself short-term goals put it somewhere public make sure that everybody in the family uh, or people that you're living with know about it and deliver to those goals and and again for me, what we like to do is sort of tick them off. And, and so therefore people can see uh, and, and people see what you've achieved. There's a nice sense of teamwork that that, that that brings together. And add on top of that, make sure you celebrate. You know what? To my mind, Friday night is still Friday night. 
Um, it's not just another night in the week. So I think, you know, if you, if you bring structure back to it, what you can then do is actually structure the week in such a way that it brings it back a little bit of normality, which I think will drive the motivation that we're looking for. And I will, I will add into that, that as you were saying, Friday night is Friday night. I had a little flashback to our little bit of Twitter banter earlier regarding mankinis. <laughs> it's Friday night, mankini night. <laughs> it's always mankini night. <laughs> Much to the dismay of the family. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, there's one specific question, actually. It's regarding cycling. Um, how do you get quicker on the flat? And riding on the flat, is it always hard? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. And I think what, what it's, what it, the, the question really points to the fact that it is about specificity. And I think it's always interesting, that, that, irrespective of sport, the bottom line is that if you're looking for, for, to, to improve in, in a certain area, you have to be as specific as you possibly can in that area to gain the greatest adaptation. Uh, now, you, you do get this, this cross-training approach where if you just go on your bike and you do some hills, you, you, you'll get a little bit better at, on the flat. But the bottom line is, if you want to be quicker on the flat, you've got to do a lot of flat work. Uh, what, what, does, what does flat work entail? Well, there are lots of determinants of speed on a bike, as there are in any sport. So things like VO2 max, velocity at VO2 max, power at VO2 max, uh, lactate threshold, stroke anaerobic threshold, whatever your, whatever your nomenclature is on that, uh, maximum power output. Um, so th there are multiple determinants. So it, what you have to think about is that what you're, what you're looking to do is profile yourself against those key specifics. And then what you're trying to do is identify areas of weakness that you're really going to target. Now, if you're unsure what your weak areas are, think about the session that you hate the most. <laughs> and that is your weakest area. <laughs> because it's the one session we always avoid. Um, you know, so I, I think... The thing is that what you, rather than think to yourself, I just need to get quicker on the flat, what you've got to think is what, what, what constitutes being a good flat rider? Uh, what do I require from that? So obviously, you know, the quicker we get, it's always an interesting one for triathletes in particular, but for, for roaders as well, is that the body position matters uh, because 80, 80% of drag is offered by the body. Uh, we, 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 you know, we, we spend hours on the bike trying to reduce the areas of the bike the resistance from the bike is, is minimal in comparison to the body so body position is absolutely everything if you are going to go down on skis there's no point going down on skis into a position where you can't push the pedal and you can't create the power it is counterproductive to, to speed and so what you should what now is a great opportunity to do that what we should be doing is experimenting on on the turbo uh making sure you get the, the optimal position it's not the best aerodynamic position you're looking for what you're looking for is the optimal position for you which enables you to generate the same amount of power for a reduction the maximum reduction in drag so and that that comes a little bit from trial and error unless you can get into into chris's wind tunnel uh, up in evesham um or one of the other wind tunnels around uh, and, and they can sort of assist you with that and then on top of that once you've done that then start thinking about other things think about things like crank length are you riding on the optimal crank length? You may well not be because you just come with a standard crank length, depend on leg length, et cetera. Make sure that the crank length is right. Um, make sure that you've got each of those in your training program, things like anaerobic, uh, sorry, things like lactate tolerance, uh, anaerobic lactate threshold, VO2 max, power at VO2 max. Make sure you've got those uh, and, and make sure that what you are doing in your training is you're addressing the weaknesses, maintaining the strengths, be, you know, it's this terrible term, which I hate because everyone rolls it out, but leave no stone unturned. You know, the bottom line is it is about marginal gains. It's about the little things. So once you've got, once you've got this wonderful, um, once you've got this wonderful grounding to deliver excellence, what you've then got to do is look for where you can make these small gains. 1% in different, I'll tell you a great, a great story. So I went into the wind tunnel last year with Chris up in Eastern. Uh, and I tried a pair of socks on, which reduced drag by 1%. Uh, now, you may not think that's really very impressive, but I'll tell you what, when you're on the bike, as long as I am, and I'm a swimmer on a bike, I'll take 1% every day. But if you, you've only got to accumulate 10, 1%, and all of a sudden you've reduced drag by 10%. That's a big, big reduction. You know? So think about, think about the marginals. But as I always say, you cannot polish a turd. 
Uh, and so unless you are prepared to put the hard work in to get better, to get faster, marginal gains will do absolutely nothing for you. It is about hard work first and foremost. Make sure that that is structured. Once you've got that, then look for those small gains that you can make. Yeah, it's consistency, isn't it? It's, it's amazing how many times people are looking for, you know, 100 gram saving on a saddle, but they won't leave the biscuit tin alone. Well, 100%. <laughs> you know, it, it is that. Honestly, I've, honestly, you can't imagine the conversations I've had over time, particularly with uh, triathletes. And they know it. You know, yeah. I'm not saying anything out of school. You, you know, they will, they will spend a grand on a bottom bracket uh, when they're probably better off spending that grand on a training camp. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, and speaking of training camps, we have got, um, it's, it's more of a comment really, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. Um, one of my ex-colleagues is on the call from Cyprus. She's um, an RAF physical training instructor, uh, and she also does a lot of re rehabilitation work. Uh, very, very keen and very, very good triathlete. She said in her capacity as a remedial instructor at the moment, she's seen a lot of over, 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 um, over training injuries yep. because some people have been furloughed. Obviously, some people have got more time on their hands now. So they're over committing is there any sort of advice you can give people there to best judge i know rpe is quite a big one and um well, but also it comes back i think again it, you know i mean so what are the two things that people don't do stretching and flexibility and recovery and i think it's across the board and i'm talking about you know olympic gold medalists through to weekend warriors you know they're the two things that, that to some extent everybody knows they should be doing them uh, but they don't tend to do them and in other words what they don't do is look after themselves uh, they think that everything is built within the program. If they're not training, they're not, they're not improving. And that is utterly untrue. You know, the, the, the only way that you improve with training is to make sure that you've got the right structure around that training. So the training should, it brings us back to what we were saying earlier on, the training should be planned, but how you look after yourself outside of that is absolutely crucial. So, you know, th things like flexibility, mobility, agility, um, things like strength training, you know, Often I see, I see athletes with low back injuries uh, and it's not about position on bike or position in, in, in boat. Uh, it's actually that they've got a weak core, uh, but they don't see any value in improving their core strength and stability. Whereas actually, as soon as, as, soon as you give them a six week program on core strength and ability, uh, stability, back pain goes away. So I think you know, what, 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 we, what you have to do is, is impress on the people that we look after and, and people who are training need to, need to understand that it is prevention is better than cure. It's as simple as that. Prevent the injury and the illness in the first place and then you don't have to worry about trying to rehabilitate from it. Brilliant, great advice as always. What I'd like to do, Greg, is conscious of the time, we've had quite a lot of questions there and we've had some to and from. So if we can bring it back onto you, if that's okay, for the last 10 minutes um, and, and things you're potentially working on right now. I know that Louise Minchin from the BBC is getting involved in the big ride in. Is that yeah. right? If, if you can share some, some information about that? Yeah, John, that'd be great. Tomorrow night, anybody can join in. So it's, it's the big night in tomorrow night. So the, the BBC are doing something on TV um, as part of Sport Relief uh, and Children in Need. Uh, and there's a whole host of different events going on. And what Louise is doing is she is doing 100 miles on her turbo trainer at home, um, uh, which, is, which is not for the faint-hearted, I tell you. <laughs> 100 miles on a bike. She's going to be on there for a good five, five and a half, six hours out of four. You know, it's a fair old time to be static on the bike. Um, but but uh, she's doing that through Zwift. Um, there are obviously, you don't need Zwift to be able to do it, but that, that you can follow it through that. But equally, we're doing it live on Instagram as well. So you can go into her page. Um, I'm joining her at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we're going to do an Insta Live before starting the challenge at five o'clock. Uh, and it, I think it just be it would just be great fun, and it is it, it, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's, it's a way to to raise money. It's a way to raise profile, to recognise actually that currently, if, if if we think as businesses we're struggling, imagine how charities are doing. Yeah. You know, the, the money coming into charities and, and the work that the third sector does is absolutely crucial to the health of this nation. You know, to social health, physical health, mental health, etc. Um, so it, it's just a great way to do that, and in, in a novel way. So uh, five o'clock tomorrow, four thirty from Instagram Live on Louise's uh, Louise's site, uh, and we're going to be doing a hundred miles for the big bike in. It's going to be it's going to be fun. It's amazing, and, and and if those have got the capacity and they're cyclists and they want to get get involved, please do. I know that um, Geraint Thomas's challenge back end of last week went on particularly well, where yeah. he did three twelve-hour shifts uh, on Zwift and 
people literally could ride alongside him for a few seconds. Uh, I think he averaged, <laughs> yeah, that's right, he's yeah. averaging 23, 24 mile an hour for a 12 hour stint. But um, I, I reckon he cooked his weight. I reckon he put his weight in low into this. Into this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe it. Yeah, yeah. We'd like Brilliant. to believe that, wouldn't we? <laughs> oh, incredible. Dif- different level, aren't they? Different level. Oh, yeah. uh, and what about anything else moving forward, Greg? So that's obviously the immediate future tomorrow. Is there anything else coming up over the next few weeks? Well, you know, one of the things that, that, that I'm working on currently is this idea around, um, uh, around how we're going to cope when we come out the back end of, of COVID. So both clinically with my team in, in Harley Street, but also I, I think what I'm working on is this idea of, of immunity. What we know with COVID is that, is that one of the key problems is those with compromised immunity uh, are those that, that both uh, are infected um, more easily. So you catch the virus more easily if you've got a, a, a suppressed immune system. And equally, you respond worse. Uh, so we know those people who have got pre-existing comorbidities, in other words, other diseases at the same time, particularly interestingly, things like metabolic disease. Um, so what, what appears to be the case from a, a, a recent American study uh, is that obesity uh, and metabolic disorders like type 2 diabetes appear to be a really, a really key issue in the severity of the disease in, in terms of hospitalization. Um, so one of the things that I'm working with my team on is actually trying to create a, a program uh, of information and guidance on how we can actually bolster our own personal immune system, taking personal responsibility um, through a whole host of different things. Obviously, avoiding infection in the first place, washing hands, physical distancing, making sure that, that we don't uh, get exposed to it, but equally about internally. So reduction in alcohol consumption, stopping smoking, uh, quality duration and quantity uh, quantity and and quality of sleep uh, redu- reduction in stress all of those type of things so basically trying to create a, a a toolbox for people to enhance their own immunity to try and give them the the best opportunity possible coming out the back of this uh, to avoid infection going forward so that, that, that's something that i'm really passionate about that I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on at the moment and there must be something linked there regarding, you know, going back to Sue's point in Cyprus, so people overtraining, obviously the immune system crashing a little bit, that they're more susceptible to illness and injury. Well, it, it, it's an interesting one because I, I put out, I mean, Chris Whitty, Professor Chris Whitty uh, mentioned last week in a, a landmark. People, I don't think, understand how important this is, but it never has a, an incumbent chief medical officer um, said how important physical activity is for health. Uh, there, there are plenty of chief medical officers who've said it, but they've always said it outgoing as they leave their job. He has said it in job that exercise is fundamentally important. He's absolutely right. I think the interesting thing was when I put that out on social media, some people came back with, and said, oh, yeah, but, you know, arduous exercise is really bad for you, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, to some extent, what we're talking about here is physical activity. Uh, you know, we're talking about moving more. That's really what we have to think about is it, what we live is very sedentary lives. You know, office workers, anybody who's an office worker out there, uh, office workers on average spend over nine hours a day seated. That's three quarters of their waking lives sat down. That's incredibly bad for our health. Uh, So really what we're talking about is actually moving more. Um, I think to your point, I think you're absolutely right. So what we do know is that arduous exercise does create immunosuppression. Uh, I've published a, a huge amount on this when I was at the British Olympic Medical Center, I've had a couple of PhD students who've worked on this area. And we know that that we do see the suppression in in, in immune function immediately post-exercise. But again, going back to what we said earlier, what we can do is we can, we can delimit that. We can limit that, uh, that, that, that response by making sure that what we have is a structured recovery program in place. Things like hydration, absolutely crucial during exercise, uh, things like carbohydrate availability or glycogen availability, at least uh, during exercise, and then post-exercise, making sure that we're building the right recovery process, we can, we can blunt that immune suppression. Uh, and so therefore, and, and again, remember, it's athletes per se, but I'm not talking about elite athletes now, I'm talking about physical active, uh, physically active people have a lower incidence of infection, particularly upper respiratory tract infections. Exercise is good for you. So the, the key is that if you are going to do a lot of exercise, you're going to do it hard, make sure you structure in recovery and think about your health yeah and i think that ties in really nicely with the you know we're looking for people to move more and talk more yep. you know from a psychological perspective that yep. we know it, it helps to be able to um the old adages are best aren't they you, you talked about it you know in terms of prevention is better than cure and um, a problem yep. shared is a problem halved and, and for some reason 
I don't know if it is technology, which I think has been a lot more positive now uh, the last few weeks, but maybe we're, we're, we're sort of stepping back into that realm of just being human again. Yeah, I, I, it's incredibly important. You know, I, I, last week I, sp I sent out um, on my social media a sort of daily top tip. And I think probably one of the most important ones I spent out, sent out was about social, about social health is that what, what we are doing with physical distancing is, is, is we're, I'm missing it. We're all missing it, that, that interaction with people. Um, and, and I think the great thing is actually that, that what we're doing now, you know, through Zoom or FaceTime or through Skype or whatever that medium is, even if you haven't got that, you know, some people say, oh, you know, but, you know, my grand hasn't, can't do the technology, just phone her, you know, use the telephone, talk to people. I think it has such a profoundly positive effect on mental, emotional health, which then has a cascade onto physical health. Uh, that I think certainly what, what this process has highlighted is two things for me. One is how important exercise is as a global health measure and also the absolute fundamental importance of social health in actually optimizing quality of life. Yeah, absolutely. And what a, what a great way to finish. Smack on the button there at half past four. Incredible. So it's been great. a few shout outs from me. Uh, a big, big thank you to everybody at SportsVS for um, providing the opportunity and the platform for this to happen. A big, big thank you for Nathan beavering away in the background and, and, and driving the chat there. And more importantly, Greg, thanks very much for, for your insight. Thanks very much for your time. And thanks very much for uh, joining us today. It's been much appreciated. Well, thanks very much for having me. And thanks for everybody who's joined in. I hope you found it uh, enjoyable and informative. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Great stuff. And just the last one from me, guys. Um, this will, will be going out as part of our newsletter, our website. Greg will share it too. Um, and on there will be all his handles and his contact details should you want to have a follow-up and get in touch with Greg and the guys at Sportsphere too. But from me and from Greg, thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much for your engagement. And we'll see you all again soon. Take Stay care safe. Now. Bye Stay now. safe, people. Bye. Bye.